Hi, welcome back to CV, I mean MEN 368. Today we are going to talk about um, an idea which has to do with how do you find deflections in beams. So why do we care about it? So let's let's get our idea together. We we are doing embodiment design. Okay, embodiment design, and we are specifically looking at how do we decide on geometry. So, when I'm looking at geometry, we realize that there are three things that I have to do. This is typically what, when we're looking at geometry, there are several aspects of design that we have to check. One is called designing for, for stiffness. The next one is called design for stability. The last one is called design for strength. Notice I have written strength last, stiffness first, stability next, because I want you to understand something. The major dimensions of most metallic structures as well as composites are determined by stiffness and stability. Strength determines small but important features. What do I mean by that? Joints, for example, are determined by strength. Holes, chamfers, fillets, all these important details are determined by strength. But typically, we want to do, determine our major dimensions by stability or stiffness. So stiffness means I need to figure out how much will it deflect. Now, this is a really a painful thing. Finding deflections, as you saw even with a beam problem, straight beam problem is a very big headache. Let's look at a much more complicated situation where we know up to now we have looked only at straight beams. But in many cases, I am interested in, let's say I have a wall here and I have a bracket. Okay, looks like that, it's attached to the wall. And I'm going to apply some force to the bracket and I want to figure out, okay, here's the bracket, looks like this. This is my crude sketch, sketch of the bracket. Okay, here's attached to the wall. And I'm applying some force F here, and the question is, how strong should I should I make? How big should this dimension be? This is by stiffness considerations, which means I have typically I am make I want to make sure that it doesn't deflect a lot. It feels stiff. Another example is I have a wrench. So you know, like a lug wrench for your car or something like that. Here's a bolt, and I'm going to apply a force here, and I want to figure out how big should this be. Again, this is a matter of stiffness. It's not a matter of strength. So, sounds surprising, but typically for these kinds of problems, stiffness will trump, trump strength until you get too close to details. And I, and I keep saying that again and again because I want that to get into your head so that automatically it is part of your DNA. That's how you think, okay? So the question is very simple. So let us look at the simplest non-trivial problem. I have a beam, I am applying a force F here and I want to find the diameter D such that deflection 
delta at tip is less than 5 mm or some such number. Okay. Now you saw this kind of thing in exam and, you're, and if you are now groaning and thinking, oh, not another, another deal with, uh, what is that, uh, with a, a singularity function. I am here to tell you that, look, the point about this is, I do not really care about the deflection anywhere here. I only want the deflection at only one point. So how do I find? Deflection at only one point. This is really quite an amazing thing. This was discovered by a very famous railway engineer. called Castiglia and this particular thing is called Castigliano second theorem. Okay. And if you are if you are thinking, oh my goodness, I am going to learn some theorem, not a big deal. Theorem means something that I can prove based on certain assumptions. Okay. I am not interested in proving the result to you in this particular case. I am interested in showing you that we are actually somewhat familiar with it and we are going to apply it to a much wider range of problems. So let us look at the simplest stupid problem now, which is I have a spring and I am applying a force F to it. Spring constant is K. It is obvious to you that deflection at tip equals uh, k times x, right? Or which is f over k. Sorry, deflection at tip is x, which is f over k. Right? So if I know the force, I can find the deflection by just dividing by spring constant. You are thinking, whoa, okay, what's the big deal? There's nothing to it. Yes, there's nothing to it, except that now we're going to look at how much energy is stored. I am going to put it in brackets because it is not really stored. All I can say is recoverable. The actual word is how much energy is recoverable. So if I look at how much energy is recoverable, then I will look at the stress strain, I mean force versus deflection and I look at this area. Okay. If I look at that area, we know it is, if the deflection is x, then the slope is k and then I know that the stored energy is half k x squared. But I am interested in something else. I am interested in this part, not the lower part of the triangle, upper part of the triangle, which turns out to be um, f times x minus half k x squared. This is called the complementary energy. And for in our particular case, it turns out to be a very nice result because of the fact that it is a rectangle and this is a diagonal. This area and that area are the same. And you can see that because f equal to kx, I can substitute it in there and I will get kx squared minus half kx squared which is half k x squared. So far, big B. But the nice thing is, I am going to rewrite this complementary energy in terms of, of f. So instead of writing it as half k x squared, I am going to write this as half k times f over k squared, which is half f squared over k. This is extremely useful. Why is that? Because I will now I can find out that the deflection 
this is where we are after all this complementary energy all of this stuff is all fine but this complementary energy the deflection u equal to partial half f squared over k with respect to f so if i take the if i take the complementary energy and differentiate it with respect to the force i'll get the corresponding displacement try it. differentiate it you will you will see so this is a very important result and a very useful result let me let me show you what i mean for our beam we had the following relationships you remember delta u equal to fl over ea right so this i can write it as du equal to uh, sorry apologies apologies delta u over l equal to f over ea okay the corresponding energy per unit length so this is displacement per unit length the energy per unit length is 1 half f squared over ea look at the similarity with this how did i get it it's very simple i multiply uh, this by so remember the displacement is delta u over l so multiply that by force so it's basically 1 half force times displacement okay and if you differentiate with respect to the force you'll get delta u delta u over l so displacement per unit length i obtained okay now let's look for shear delta v was equal to vl over ga similarly i will get delta v over l equal to v over ga which implies energy complementary energy per unit length equals half v square over ga now remember what was that for bending delta theta equals ml over ei so delta theta over l equals m over ei and complementary energy per unit length is half m square over ei okay for torsion delta phi was equal to tl over gj delta phi over l equal to t over, over gj complementary energy per unit length is half t square over gj okay so for a beam for any beam so now we are at the major point and this is a really important point for any beam the total complementary energy per unit length equals sum of f squared over ea plus v squared sorry 1/2 v squared over ga plus m squared over ei plus t squared over gj typically speaking these two are really important
because they will contribute more to the deflections this will contribute very little to the deflections okay so now so i am talking about something so let me let me state very explicitly what is castigliano statement Castigliano's second theorem says if an elastic body is in equilibrium under the action of external forces acting at various locations then the deflection at xi so how much does it deflect at that point equals the derivative of the complementary energy with respect to f i so that's the statement so let's look at what we mean by that so i have a beam in which there is some force somewhere f1 f2 f3 etc okay so suppose i want to find the deflection at this point i first have to find the complementary energy of the beam with respect to f2 that's all i have to do i just find the complementary energy differentiate with respect to f2 and i'll find the and i'll find the displacement delta 2 and you are thinking man this is sounds very complicated look the point of all of these things is to make the calculations easy not to make them complicated ideas are complicated but the calculations are easy they are easier than a previous approach okay so you i will show you that this if you get this into your head the calculation of of deflections of even very complicated structures will become very easy by the way experts in structures and frames and things like that always use complementary energy as the way to go castigliano second theorem as the way to go they will not do singularity functions on a common basis they so always do this because it's faster okay and there are several techniques for doing this so let's look at our simplest problem so how do we do this so now i i showed you this new piece this new ingredient in our mix which is this complementary energy so how do i find the complementary energy so let us look at example 1 I have a beam, okay, with a force F. Okay, notice what I did. I flip the beam around. This is very important idea. So always put the free end at x equal to zero. It will make your life a lot easier. 
much easier i'll tell you so if you know this step 2 so this is a b draw sfd and bm so if this is x then that's easy right because sfd looks like this sorry the shear force diagram looks like this jumps down and goes like that v of x equal to f there's nothing to it it's just a downward pointing rectangle bending moment looks like this m equal to k times x i mean sorry f times x right so now so this we can do very easily so now we say okay see find complementary energy we have the version in our case it looks like 1 half v of x square over ga plus 1 half m of x square over ei where did i get this from our spring analogy this thing remember this guy in our case i don't have axial force so i don't consider that i don't have torque so i don't consider that if they are present i'll put it in generally speaking if you have bending moments i will ignore this generally speaking bending moments and torques always trump um, uh, shear force and axial force they will not add much to it so now we are ready so i know m of x so this looks like complementary energy and this and the symbol there's no simple symbol for that i'm going to use the symbol g i'll talk to you about that later so g equals 1 half m of x is f times x whole square divided by ei which is 1 half f squared x squared over ei this is the complementary energy per unit length so what's the total complementary energy that's easy to do g total equals integral 0 to l 1 half f squared x squared over ei dx this is per unit length hey this is easy integral to do and i should get 1 half f squared over ei integral x squared dx 0 to l which turns out to be 1 over 6 f squared l cube over ei differentiate it and see i mean integrate it and see now we are ready apply castigliano what do i mean by that the deflection at l equal to partial g total with respect to force at l so force at l is f so this is partial g total with respect to f which turns out to be differentiate that you get fl cubed over 3 ei so i got the deflection directly i didn't have to integrate i didn't have to apply boundary conditions nothing everything is done for me is that interesting right of course you can see that i can do one shortcut which is a very useful shortcut
dg total d f equals partial with respect to f of integral 0 to l 1 half f squared x squared over e i right d x which turns out to be integral 0 to l start out with original was 1 half m squared over e i d x right so this I can write this as partial with respect to f integral 0 to l 1 half times 2m dm df over ei dx which turns out to be integral 0 to l m over ei dm df. This turns out to be very very useful by the way because it will turn out that I can do a lot of simplification with this. This is what we will actually use. Not even this. So what is this shortcut? It says do the differentiation first before you integrate. Don't integrate everything and then do the differentiation. It turns out to be a little bit easier. In our case, this will turn out to be 0 to L fx over ei. dm dx will give you x over um, uh, m is kx sorry m equal to fx so if I differentiate it I will get times x dx so it will give me directly the result f l cube over 3 e i if I integrate it at the so let me write this down properly so from here to here we went definition of g total from here to here we went chain rule from here to here we went substitute so this all chain rule still and then from here to here we went substitute m equal to fx and from here to here To go from here to here, I just did integrate. Okay, so, but as far as our application goes, we will always use this guy. So, what Castigliano's theorem does for us is to allow us to directly find the displacement once you have the bending moment diagram. You don't even have to go to theta x and y of x or anything. You can get this directly from the bending moment diagram. So if you know how to write the bending moment as a function of x, you can actually integrate, you can, you can use this one and you can find the displacement at various locations. And hence, you can design for stiffness. So Castigliano's theorem directly helps you calculate things for stiffness. With that, we are done.